All right, so here we are, the four of us. I'm Catherine Accurso. We also have Monica, Harini, and I here. Um, if you're joining us now, you've seen our AAAL uh, presentation about equity, multiliteracies, and COVID-19. Um, but maybe like many of you, after watching a presentation or recording your own, maybe you had the feeling that you weren't quite done talking about your work. And so we're just here to have a little bit of casual follow-up conversation about um, some of what we discussed in our presentation. Uh, and I think particularly we're interested in spending some time talking about or unpacking the implications. And so I'd like to just kick off the conversation here by posing uh, a question to my fellow researchers here about what implications stood out to you the most from this work? And what would you like to discuss more about the implications? So over to you, team. Um, I, I think, you know, and, and, and as we said, like, you know, 20 minutes, and a year long and with so many participants. So one of the things that we did do, as you know, is um, focus on one case. Um, and there's still, you know, there, there were a lot of cases that we, we could have talked about, but um, particularly for um, in the case of AA, um, there were all these, these um, multiple threads that we wanted to draw, draw together, right? Um, but particularly um, related to our first research question, one of the implications that we didn't quite get a chance to talk about uh, was um, our roles as instructors and researchers within um, this project and, um, and how um, the action research piece of this played out and how we engaged um, with um, um, the whole um, research, of course, with the, the luxury that that comes only with having the time and the space to look back at our um, teaching and our instruction over a period of time um, and to think reflexively and reflectively both um, uh, about our own practices. Um, so one of the things that we as a group talked about that we, we wanted to share was you know, how do our, our um, individual um, positionalities and how do our individual preferences uh, for social justice or for interest in equity or interest in multimodality or interest in multilingualism or multiliteracies broadly um, make themselves um, enact themselves within our classrooms and uh, one of the things that I learned was um, what a privilege it is to be able to do this work, but also how much more work um, I need to do. Um, even though I thought I was being quite conscious of multiliteracies in my teaching, um, but just thinking about Ace's comment that we we need to know how to actually enact multilingual pedagogies within the classroom. Because yes, you talk about multiliteracies. Yes, you talk about the value of languages in the classroom. But as teacher educators. Um, how are, how am I modeling that? And as pre-service teachers, how are they being able to take that modeling and move it to, um, socially just, um, classroom space, um, especially given their various constraints as, as being in, in limbo in various positions as being students within our space, as being teachers within the classroom space where they're doing their practicum and, and, um, you know, wh where is my role? That's what I'm thinking about. Um, and I'm, I don't have an answer. I'm, I'm just posing this as a question and something that I am thinking about uh, quite carefully in terms of practices that I, as um, um, an instructor um, and activities even, specific activities. And I know I did those. I know we brought in dual language texts. I know we did activities where we brought in their home languages um, and, and in small groups, we spoke about this, but it wasn't enough, I think. Um, and that's, that's my takeaway. It wasn't enough to, to build that confidence um, that they felt that they could take it beyond. Um, that's one implication that I have learned reflexively for myself that I really need to go back to my practice and um, consider that carefully. 
Harini, can you say another word or two about the kinds of activities? I know you mentioned dual language books, but maybe um, maybe you want to tell our viewers a little bit more about um, the types of activities that you did with multiliteracies in mind. Um, so we can start to just talk about additional or more thorough uses as we continue on in, in literacy instruction. Um, and again, as we said in our presentation, we did a lot of multimodal activities, right? Um, um, so a lot of drawing, a lot of um, video um, where they brought in their, their life. So di digital um, literacy things. Um, um, I think that a couple of the, the multilingual um, activities that I did was definitely bringing in my home languages um, as one activity and sort of talking them through that. So we, so I had a um, uh, an activity where I introduced my favorite animal, which is a yani. And I'm going to try that out with us, and we'll see. Um, I haven't practiced this, but let's try. So uh, my favorite animal is the yani. It has the largest ears and uh, is very persistent. Very, very pericy. And the kutiyane is also very pericy. Um, and one of the things that I love about yanes is that they're very intelligent and very caring. They are matriarchal societies and that travel in large groups um, and are the most gentle, gentle creatures that I've ever seen. Um, so something like this, right? So I had this whole introduction and now by now, presumably all of you know what a yane is, an elephant, and that kutti means little. And, you know, so we had this start of this conversation. It was all this translanguaging. Uh, um, and then we split into smaller groups um, and we they all tried this activity with whatever languages they chose. Um, and those that didn't feel comfortable or didn't have another language that they felt they could bring in tried drawing and they tried, they tried other. And then of course it, it, you know, it evolved into conversations about how this, this could um, happen within their classes with, with the students in their class. Um, and I thought it was a, I, in my mind, again, going back to reflexive, I thought it was a really generative discussion um, and I thought that we had this openness to how, um, you know, how, how linguistic uh, resources are powerful resources. Um, but I, I, you know, so that was that was one activity, for instance. Monica, do you want to talk about um, the dual language books that um, the from Storybooks Canada? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Harini. And I agree that that activity about the the yane it was very productive. I think. Um, in, I was there. I was participating in that in that activity, and um, so that was one example of a, a play an opportunity for for teacher candidates to center their own languages. And I remember also some teacher candidates who self identified as as monolingual, um, really struggling with that. So I think there was some productive dissonance there of, wait, we don't feel equipped to do this. What, what do we do? Um, but dual language texts, yeah. So we, it, at various points, actually throughout the program, we brought in Storybooks Canada and also Indigenous Storybooks um, as digital resources that, that have um, multiple languages as well as multi, their multimodal resources with the opportunity to listen to languages um, interact with illustrations, etc. Uh, as well as there are, I think, especially Harini, you brought in dual language texts constantly. So, I mean, that was just a normalization, I think, of dual language texts throughout the course, which, it, which I think was really powerful and generative of, of quite a few important conversations. Um, yeah, some of the comments that we heard from A at the reflecting back on the courses, I think were really 
instructive in terms of her saying she just needs way more opportunity to see what it looks like in practice and to actually do it herself because I do think we did offer some opportunities but it's it's a stark reminder I think that the paradigm shifts are so massive when someone like A throughout her whole schooling experience K to 12 and undergrad have been sounds like they were really intensely monolingual environments for for a and and um so pushing back against those what 16 plus years um and saying actually multilingualism plurilingualism multiliteracies multiculturalism these are all resources your racial identity also you know these are these are resources it's really pushing back against a lifetime of socialization. And so there's so much unlearning to be done. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind that, you know, planting a few seeds here and there is really, really important, but that um, the paradigm shifts are, we're really pushing against monolingual ideologies that, ha that are prevalent everywhere in their own, the histories, um, in the experiences of, of of our teacher candidates and including in their practicum placements, right? Um, for someone like A to be able to say, there were only two English language learners in my practicum and therefore it's not a priority. I think that teaches us a lot, um, power dynamics of a practicum. A reflected on, um, you know, my uh, school advisor, doesn't teach multilingually and so I don't feel like I can either right the power dynamics and the identities involved of being a, simultaneously a, a student and a teacher um, so I think we need to it's a it's a stark reminder that we need to do a lot more as teacher educators but certainly that we need to integrate multilingualism much more systematically throughout throughout the program, because if if we as people who are super keen and um, you know oriented with regards to multilingualism, to the extent that we're doing this inquiry, um, aren't doing enough. Um, I'm just thinking about you know how to build it into the program um, in a in a much more systematic way. Monica, you raised an interesting question there with your phrasing of um, doing enough. And I think sometimes that's that's on my mind quite a bit is, are we doing enough, the right question, or is it where are our spheres of influence and how can we sort of leverage our positions in the different ways that we're involved in teacher education? Um, and this is something I feel like I'm thinking about more as a, a pretty new faculty member within our department. Um, all of a sudden, you know, I'm in different spaces than I've been in in the past and, and I'm starting to learn kind of what opportunities there are for impacting different parts of the teacher education program. And so one of the implications I'm thinking about has to do with what are we doing within the classes that we're teaching and that's the, the action research piece. But in addition, what are we doing in the way that we, we handle admissions into the teacher education program? And what are we doing in, in the way that we encourage collaboration between uh, faculty who are working with the same students so that there's reverberations of these things? And, um, and what in, in what ways are we selecting practicum placements and also faculty advisors? Because as you pointed out, these are the people who um, like really concretely say, yes, that's a best practice or no, try this instead. And, and there is that kind of dynamic too. And so I, I think for me, the implications are, are really like a spider web in some ways. Like this is, this is what we're gonna do with the course sequence, maybe this time around, but also, in these areas of service or in these areas, these other areas of scholarship that, that maybe we weren't thinking about when we started the study, I'm really thinking about now um, and what the lessons from A and, and her other cohort members are in terms of how they travel in, in other parts of faculty life. Because um, we, do, we do have a lot of resources at the university that we can use differently, I think. Um, and maybe the question isn't, is it enough, but what moves can I make here? 
I though I had a question for you too. Um, yes. I was wondering what it was like to meet a our focal participant through her data because you got to join our team after the the courses had finished. What was that like yes. for you? And what did you um, take? Away? Thank you because I was just going to talk about that. Um, so you know, as a racialized minority myself and being a linguistic minority. I just felt so close to like to, to A and very much sim sympathized with um, what she went through. And my, um, so, you know, even though I never met her in person, um, I just felt like I know this person because it's all the things that she was um, giving us as a data was just spoke to my mind so um, closely. Um, and you know all these activities that you did on multiliteracy, um, multilingualism, multimodality. I think they are really wonderful. I think what comes to at the end of the day, however, it's about are you going to be evaluated by that? It's a fun activity. You can do that, and it's oh, it's fun. And as a monolingual, I felt a little com uncomfortable. That's fine. But if you're not actually being evaluated, and if, if it's not an official um, asset just feels it like you can't <laughs> if you know at the end of the day you'll be evaluated by English um, it's not going to really you know whatever nice things you say it it won't change their um, way of thinking or belief dispositions so I think um, yeah the um, takeaway for us is really how are we going to reflect this in our evaluation um, and um, yeah, make it official structural change, um, as Monica said. Um, but what can we do to do that? How are we going to evaluate assignments? Are we going to accept multilingual assignments? And how are we going to um, assess that if we don't have the language, you know, to improve the program moving forward? You make a great point there about um, evaluation. And that gets me thinking about two things, which is one within the courses, the literacy sequence that we're talking about, what are the kind of forms of evaluation that we rely on and what models do we provide that go with those forms of evaluation? And so that's one question, but you also now have me thinking about um, like the assessment methods course. I, a lot of folks who are watching this will you know, we'll think about like, what's the assessment class, the teacher candidates take at your, your institution. Um, but um, I guess I had been thinking about the need for professional development within like our instructor team uh, and, and ways we can sort of build in some like professional group learning ourselves as we're teaching these courses. But I wonder actually if it, that needs to also be a little bit more of a networked practice, you know, Do, if we want to talk about multilingual and multimodal assessment in the literacy sequence, like maybe we also need to be having periodic meetings with the, the instructor team who's teaching the assessment course, right? So that what we're modeling kind of, again, reverberates maybe across the courses. That's interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, and you know, the assessment people who are specializing assessment are not necessarily interested in um, diversity or multilingualism. So how are we going to narrow that gap? I think that could be one of, yeah, our role too. It was very interesting looking at some of A's assignments and some of her comments also, and several other teacher candidates who are participants in the study who found it easier, more accessible to integrate issues of indigeneity and sometimes even indigenous languages than the languages of their students in the class. So it's fantastic the priority that is given to issues of indigeneity, um, including a standalone course in our particular program. They have an indigenous issues course, um, as well as in virtually every assignment, they are required to address um, first, pe first people's principles of learning. So it's constantly, and every course has to have indigenous issues integrated in some way, shape or form. It's such a priority in the program with still a ways to go certainly, but so I'm thinking of that as um, 
it just makes me think about possibilities. What if within a template that we offer for a lesson plan, you know, there's an uh, there's a box that says, how are you addressing first people's principles of learning? What if there's also a box that says, how are you supporting multilingual learners? How are you bringing multilingualism and multimodality um, perhaps into, into this lesson plan? I think that that, that you know, resonates with the question of assessment, but it also has to do with structurally, how do we bring this into the program? I have learned a lot from the work of, I, I love the work of Esther de Jong specifically and from through her and her colleagues, I've learned a lot, lot about what's been going on in Florida where the policy environment has mandated that all teachers be prepared to support English language learners. Um, and so, you know, that has implications certainly for teacher, uh, teacher educator professional development, as Catherine, you mentioned, um, as well as finding ways program at a programmatic level of integrating these issues and centering multilingual learners, uh, you know, normalizing that this is when we talk about teaching, who are we teaching? Well, we are teaching multilingual learners. Um, so I think there's a lot, a lot to learn from there also. Uh, something you mentioned just caught my attention again, which is about policy. We didn't have a great deal of time in our, our presentation to talk about the policy context, but I wonder what you all think about um, the way the curriculum here in British Columbia either kind of provides opportunities for us to do this work and see it reflected within the way we're interpreting the, the standards and the curriculum, or in some ways constrains what we're talking about here. Has do any of you have thoughts about um, just the policy context that we're sending teachers out into and what, what that might mean for our conversation? I'm thinking here of in, in the US kind of work that talks about while the Common Core state standards, which are kind of you know widely adopted curriculum frameworks, there are in many ways constrictive, but in some ways really do have these um, openings for linguistic diversity and the way they talk about the different kinds of communication um, students are supposed to be engaging in is quite quite multiple and flexible. That language is built into the standards there, and I I wonder if um, sort of we can use those same opportunities within the BC curriculum to uh, I don't know, justify the type of work that uh, we're talking about here. But what do you see as other po possible policy affordances or constraints? I think that's part of the layered nature of this work, right? I think just, just from uh, two things jump out of me from just what you said. Um, um, just from the curricular perspective, there is now with, with you know, with, with the curriculum, there's this emphasis on process, this emphasis on um, communication broadly um, as a competency, right? So if we're able to think about language as a communicational competency, rather than English language as a communication competency, um, you know, if we're able to broaden our understanding of what languages are included within our competencies, right? And just going back to my point about process, if we're able to think about it as a process, um, rather than as I perfectly pointed out, which is what's your final document being, you know, what, where is your point of assessment? Is it that document? Is it the document that you finally turn in in English? Which often in university, you know, it is something that we, I think about and in schools as well. But if we move to how are we developing that document? What is the process by which we got to where we are? What is our, the, how are we moving to that space of thinking rather than what is, where have you landed, right? So to, to, to and the, the BC curriculum does offer that space. Um, how we're taking that up, you know, um, each classroom, each school, each teacher does their own um, you know, and makes their own, which is which is actually the beauty of the curriculum too, because it, it does allow you to make it your own. Um, so maybe for us to reframe 
assessment as we've been doing to think about process, which then supports, I think, a way of thinking about uh, linguistic resources as being part of that communicational repertoire and part of that process. Um, you know, that's, that, that's the one thing that jumps at me. Also same with multimodality, right? Like if we, if we move from, if we look at finished product, multimodality is only halfway there. The, your product might be only halfway there in terms of meeting all your rubrics and your requirements and you know, all of those things. But if you look at process, um, there's a lot going on. So, so I, think, I think we have the same, that, that's definitely an affordance of the curriculum, right? Harini, I'm gonna ask you one more thing um, because I know during the, our, our sort of analysis meetings, you were really thinking a lot about multimodality, use of multimodality broadly versus use of multimodality to meet specific equity goals. And so I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, your thoughts there, because that was also sort of a very quick line in our implications bit. Uh, yeah, what were, what were you thinking about? This is my pet soapbox. Yay. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I do think that because, um, and as, as we've all been speaking about, like multimodality, multilingualism are so intertwined, um, but often, um, I think the, you know, the quick understanding of multimodality that, that we, that often I notice when I talk with teacher candidates or teachers or even just people who are not scholar researchers is the understanding of multimodality equals technology, right? And I, I think, yes, it does. In, in, in technology is a modality, but it's not all the modalities. Gesture is a modality and, and talk with drawing and, um, movement and uh, drama and voice and uh, we have these range of modalities um, which do not depend on technology and um, do not depend on the price that comes with technology you know and so having access to um, digital resources is expensive having access to internet that is required for digital resources is expensive both for um, schools that often have one cart of iPads to share, you know, with like 10 classes um, and for families that are working right now at home through the pandemic. Um, and so not everybody has access to a digital device with high speed internet with fantastic uh, audio and video quality. And um, what does that mean when we think about modality, multimodality in a certain way as being equivalent with technology. Who does it um, gatekeep when we think, and then how, how are we being, how are we thinking of equity if we're thinking of um, accessing digital resources um, at every point when we're thinking of multimodality, when often, um, as we know, minoritized linguistic communities are often um, vulnerable communities in many other ways. So, you know, I, I, I think we need to re, 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 really trouble that. I want to, you know, as we've been thinking about, right, I really want to trouble that space of thinking of multimodality as, as um, often unidimensional. Do you think COVID has, is going to make that harder or easier? Because just some some parallel survey data I've been working with from elementary and secondary teachers across the US and Canada really shows that thinking about multimodality for equity is going right to that digital access space during COVID, like who has devices, who has high speed internet. What do you think that means for nuancing our understanding of multimodality for equity? Because that's where I think that's where so many people's attention is right now when it comes to um, equity and multimodality, it goes right to just what you mentioned, um, tech devices and internet access. That is that is such a tough one, especially with COVID. Um, it, it was always a tough one, I think, because there was, there's always been this, uh, this, this, you know, difficult space where there have always been children who come to school without access to devices without access to um, 
internet at home. Um, and now it's just uh, ex exploded in a sense, right? Um, and, and scholars have been talking about this for a long time in, in the sense of that, that unequal distribution. Um, but I feel COVID is just front and center. Um, and, um, and it's also forced us to think about exactly as you said, the ways in which it's come down to the wire, right? It's, it's, if you need to be in school, you need to have a digital device and, and internet. And that's not what families are, were ready for. Um, and so, you know, how does, how does that speak to, um, and, and it goes back in a sense to the roots of multiliteracies, uh, which started out, you know, with the, the New London Group's intention um, to offer a more socially just, a more um, inclusive way of thinking about how education happens. Right, how learning happens, or how and how societies are moving. Um, I don't have an answer, but but you're right. It's it's a complex space, and then how, so maybe maybe we think about this as as a good opportunity to reframe, to rethink um, what we're doing as societies to offer more just spaces, um, because now that we're Fingers crossed, coming out of, you know, getting vaccines, moving to a, a different phase of COVID. Um, when our children come back to school, like how else are we thinking about multimodality? How else can we think about multiliteracies that puts equity and justice front and center? It's an opportunity, right? Another follow-up here, throwing this to the whole group. How possible is it to put equity and justice front and center while one third of the literacy sequence is called teaching English as an additional language? And um, we're trying to sort of do this work about creating multilingual ecologies within a course that, I mean, from its record on the books as a class and its purpose within the curriculum and et cetera, et cetera, centers English in its very title. What's the, what's the relationship between English centrism in our program and all its forms and, and doing what you're talking about by putting justice and equity in the center? Important question, Catherine. Thank you for that. I, I don't think that I have answers, um, but of course, how we, of course, language is so important way. I mean, just what if we center multilingual learners um, throughout everything, I mean, we have more power within the language and literacy courses. So let, let's start there. If, um, but moving away from even the term English language learners towards multilingual learners and multilingual resources um, and linguistic repertoires, semiotic repertoires, I think about, I, you brought in some really good points about A's experience of unbelonging and how that was um, reinforced largely throughout the program. If we, I just keep wondering how we can better center multilingual learners, including A, so centering multilingual learners within the teacher education program um, which is not reflective of the demographics of the diversity of, of the broader society, right? Our teacher candidates, um, you know, represent a diverse, diverse, uh, a lot of diverse groups. Um, but, you know, there are a, a lot of white English dominant teacher candidates also. Um, how do we center multilingualism and create an environment where we assume that they will be going, you know, that they will be working with richly multiling in richly multilingual contexts. Um, and to really experience the equity dimensions of that, the 
Catherine, in your class, one activity that stands out for me is the, the Farsi lesson, um, where teacher candidates watched uh, a lesson in Farsi um, and, and responded in various ways. And that really made some people, and in the reflections, we saw that it made some of them uncomfortable. Um, a sense of helplessness was one word that that came up. Um, so how do we create some of those experiences um, where people really feel, experience, embody some of the equity issues and inequity issues um, that happen when we center a language that um, is less familiar to some than others Yeah, so those are some of the questions that that I'm thinking about. Um, how much of the um, for if the course is built um, around ELL, is it in your capacity to change it to multilingualism, or is it not? Are you um, just um, you know working with the BC curriculum, the the title of the how you name what you teach, or can you um, change it to multilingualism? and multilingual resource? Is that in um, your capacity? I think that's a great question. And actually, um, I tend to be a person who's a little bit more like, well, let's try it and see, <laughs> and see if someone tells us it's not in our capacity. Um, because to be honest, I think a lot of some, a lot of these shortcomings or what feel like shortcomings to us might just be kind of a, a lack of resource, you know? A, a lot of folks who have good intentions, but not a lot of time and and sort of aren't in a position to make the kind of cohesive links that we're talking about. And so it seems like of the resources we have, we have really knowledgeable instructors. We have folks with interests and inclinations toward more equitable instruction in society, but Sometimes I think the, the thing that holds us back is literal spreading of time and resource out in a way that um, where we're stepping on our own toes. And so maybe if our question is, can we do something? I, I almost wonder, what if we just do it and then see, <laughs> you know, you know? Um, because sometimes the, the institutional barriers are, I find in a number of institutions I've worked with so far is, Sometimes you can't find the person who knows where where that policy came from or why that course is the way it is now. So I don't know. I'm feeling a little bit um, energized, liberated. I don't know what the right word is to try it and see. Um, but I also wondered if maybe as a team we wanted to talk about speaking of um, choices about what to center, because we always have lots of choices about what we put front and center in front of students and what we use to tie together the aspects of our practice. Maybe we wanna talk just briefly about why we chose to center A's case among um, the many teacher candidates that we looked at as part of this project. Does anybody wanna just talk a little bit about that? I think Catherine, you talked about that when um, you suggested to put A as a center that, you know, maybe putting her as a center if we can make A um, fulfilled, if, she, if we can bring her potential to, um, what's the word, full, <laughs> we could actually make all the other students um, potential um, fulfilled too. Um, it's uh, maybe it is we, that, you know, A is who we, we should center to um, so that all the A's problem might resonate to um, other students and bringing her case as the um, core would actually make the program as a whole better. And I think that's what you are saying, so. I have a secret hope actually that, well, it's not so secret, but um, one of the things that's important to me is thinking about sustained professional development. I know as a team, we were like, wow, our study has started and it finished and these people are graduated all in one year. Um, but to some degree, I wonder if if we're able to center students who have been tended, tended to be more marginalized in our program over time, 
if we invest not just our research energies there, our, research, our, our partnership energies there, not really, she's not someone we're researching. She's, you know, was certainly part of the, the team actively herself. But I wonder if that actually answers our question about, well, how do we um, work towards uh, practicum placements that resonate with what we're trying to do? I think we invest in teachers in our program and then second generation, then we have new practicum placements that maybe will reverberate more. And maybe we're, you know, through, through the sustained professional development of folks who are graduating from our very short program, we, we start to through generations. Uh, tackle some of the bigger implications about how we change the system. If we want better practicum placements, we have to invest in those places. Um, but it's it's a it's a time commitment and a long game, don't you think? <laughs> but also, diversity is that one minority. If you only care about the majority, that's not caring about diversity. So if if diversity is going to be our, um, you know, first priority, it is that one person that we have to focus and there's no need to justify that because that is the diversity, right? Absolutely. Important point. And also, I don't think in a sense um, that our, um, our classes with pre-service teachers are that different from, you know, what we learn about in classroom work with um, students who have many languages and, and powerful ways of communication um, and centering those um, and not, you know, and, and um, raising those voices um, raises everybody's voice. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the knowledge we have from research with in classrooms, right? And wh why would that be different for us as teacher educators. So to sort of center um, the voices and stories of those who feel like they are have been silenced, um, in a sense, unsilences and raises the voices of everyone. Um, and so, you know, exactly, I that that in a sense, maybe that is our that can be a goal, right? That's and and it, it feels right now anyway, with the same high, Catherine, that you were saying, you know, it feels like that's, that's actionable. That's something we can try. Um, it's, it's very, you know, it, it feels doable um, to sort of bring that same focus that as teachers, we are able to do in classrooms with children to bring that in um, to this space. But I also wanted to quickly think about systems, since we were talking about systems and, and structures, um, and we were talking about constraints, um, one of the things I think that that um, we do have to consider, definitely in Canada anyway, is, you know, our historic sort of our, uh, legacy with um, multiculturalism with a bilingualism framework, right? Our understanding of this as all cultures are welcome, but we speak English and French here, you know? So, so that, um, that dichotomy that's been around for decades um, and how that's, that's in all policy, right? We, we welcome cultures and everyone, but our official, our official way of talking is this right? And and now, of course, we're trying hard as 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 you know to embrace indigenous languages, indigenous culture. But it's it's been in, in the neglected and ignored um, for so long. So in some sense, I really want to go back even to that structural historical space where this is how we have, as a nation, even considered languages um, within our all our spaces. And of course, that's going to trickle down to school systems and policy and everything else. So, again, I don't have I don't have an answer for how we're going to change the Canada's bilingual policy. But you know, I, I do think that that does have, just from a critical lens, that has something to do with how um, structures operate. 
Well, that is the structure, right? So that's, <laughs> it is the, um, yeah, the most, I guess, powerful policy and structure we have. And that is how we are at the end of the day, how we are evaluated, whether we get a job or everything is basically um, based on that. So, yeah. But there are ways to work and, you know, there, there must, there, there should be <laughs> ways to, um, you know, it's not about limiting English, limiting French, but it is, you could, this space, there's so many space to add other languages and um, somehow make that a asset of our cultural asset and, you know, linguistic asset. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for zooming out to that broader picture. And to me, that really resonates with how multiliteracies really needs to go hand in hand, necessarily goes hand in hand with critical pedagogy. Um, and I was interested to learn throughout the program that the even the idea of critical literacy um, was new to many of these educators. Um, including some who did demonstrate quite critical dispositions. Uh, so centering obviously critical pedagogy and what we do, what we embody, and also talking about, you know, critical literacy, critical opportunities for critical pedagogy and how that necessarily goes hand in hand with multiliteracies for purposes of equity. Um, I think there's a lot of potential there um, certainly, including opportunities to in our language and literacies classes to talk to direct, address directly issues of Anglo normativity or English supremacy and white supremacy in the same conversations, right? And and conversations about um, guesthood and indigeneity also of. Uh, of who le whose languages are valued in what kinds of ways, including in assessment as, as I is so, so um, elegantly articulating. Yeah, so we, I see that we are running a little bit short on time now. So maybe we can just wrap up with, um, maybe each of us can share just one sort of uh, key takeaway that's on our minds just right now and I'm sure and I hope actually we'll have more rich conversations with folks on um, through the AAAL conference platform or just out out in the world through email or something like that but maybe we can just sign off with um a takeaway each or a final comment each I you're right below me on my screen can I throw it to you first <laughs> Okay, well, my takeaway as I, I'm going to repeat myself, but really, um, as a teacher educator, model what we say and what we believe and um, do the thing we are saying. So, um, but uh, we don't have all the answers. So, I think our really um, next step is to think what we could do um, concretely um, and take action to. Um, include multilingualism in our actual teaching and course design. Who do you want to throw it to next? Um, well, Monica, you're right beside me, so I'll throw it to Monica. Sure, I'm thinking about how do we systematically integrate these issues that we're, we're passionate about um, and see as key social justice issues into the program. Um, our own practice, yes, but that even if we never teach these courses again, how will these issues continue to reverberate across the program? Because we've seen that if we just do a few, you know, brilliant nuggets of multilingual teaching, um, it's, it, it's, it, it, it it's insufficient. It needs to be integrated systematically into the program. Who will you kick it to next? Go for it, Harini. 
okay, um, you're also wise. So it's not, it's not you know, it's it, we're, we, all of us um, have all these, you know, we're all here because we want, we want to make this better, right? We want, we recognize there's a problem. I, I somehow feel like the word collaboration and solidarity ringing in my head. Um, and so, you know, um, I always go back to Jim Cummings' collaborative construction of power, almost as a way of thinking about inclusive pedagogies. Um, and so how are we, we have, you know, we, we've talked about uh, constraints and challenges and then possible ways of moving forward. And to me, in collaboration um, broadly, and also within classroom spaces, within, within like groups like us, we're collaborating on an action research project, you know, collaboration within the classroom with groups of children who can build each other up and solidarity between colleagues who have um, resources with this, but not with that or, and, and you know, so, so somehow to me that that's, those are the words that are ringing in my head, you know, to build collaboration and solidarity in a sense of, of bringing, um, of, of bringing, um, I think capacities together and, and hence power together, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's sort of where I'm going. You, Catherine? I'm reading, you took my takeaway. <laughs> no, I'm, I think I'm also really um, walking away from this conversation um, and not from the project because it's still ongoing really, but um, with, a, um, well, I guess if I had to pick keywords besides collaboration, I think I would talk about investment in professional development across kind of what we think of as separate spaces. So our professional development being intertwined with that of our teacher candidates and um, across levels of the university, you know? So between each of us has our different roles, but seeing all of our professional development is very intertwined and being invested in that. Um, the other thing I'm taking away, I think is related to your mention of inclusion and inclusive uh, pedagogy. And I've just been really thinking about a phrase um, as a way to take a little spin on inclusion. Um, affirming the rightful presence, not just focusing on inclusion, but affirming the rightful presence of the diversities that are, that are, that are affirming them inside university spaces. And I think that's something I'm really um, thinking about how to connect investments with affirming the rightful presence of existing normal diversities in the next actions we take. And so I guess I'm, I'm walking away with a little bit of a a triangle image in my mind now that unites all the things you've shared too. So, well, thank you everyone for joining us for a little more casual chat and we'd love to chat casually with you in other venues as well. So please do feel free to contact any of us um, by email. Our contact info is in the AAAL presentation. Um, yeah, have a great conference and hopefully we'll talk to you more soon. Bye. <laughs>